Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. One of the strangest characteristics of religious psychology is the commonly held belief that those who have received instruction are better than those left untaught. We don't phrase it that way, but the implication of consumerized evangelism is that others need what we have so that they can become like us. It is precisely this arrogant mentality that is condemned in Matthew's Gospel. What the others truly need is not us, but what we were given despite our wickedness to save them from becoming as evil as we are. Moreover, our wickedness knows no bounds, not only for having passed judgment on them, but for refusing to bear fruit for their sake through instruction. Truly, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than it will be for us. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 20 to 24. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 289 of the Bible as Literature podcast, coming off of last week's episode where we explored the way in which the Matthean Jesus undermines what we call ideology and what Scripture calls idolatry. In today's episode, we're going to pick up with a theme that is central to the Gospel of Matthew, heralded by John the Baptist very early in the story, and that is the importance of repentance, that one must repent in order to enter the kingdom of the heavens. And that sets up a very interesting discussion of these cities in verses 20 to 24. It's not crying. It's not feeling sad. It's not feeling sorry. That's not what repentance is. It really involves a different way of acting. And here's how the mechanism works. When you're confronted with the kingdom of heaven, which John tried to do with his listeners, John the Baptist, you hear that it's at hand. And so you are supposed to bring fruit worthy of repentance, which means a new kind of action. And how does that work with this idolatry and this change of ideology that you just mentioned, Father? When your ideology is smashed, like an idol is smashed, then you come and you act in a different way. The fruit worthy of repentance is a different way of acting. It's not a different way of thinking. It's not a different way of feeling. It's a different way of acting. So when you hear that you must bring fruits worthy of repentance, you have to be ready to conduct your life according to the ideology that Scripture is imposing on you as opposed to the ideology that you are imposing on Scripture. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. When I was a kid, we used to always hear at church that because we had heard the teaching of Jesus Christ, we were under greater judgment than people who had not heard it. And the more we were graced with education, the more responsible and the more culpable we became because our behavior was no different than the people who hadn't received the teaching. Now, in the scriptural matrix, that's the way it works. It's a kind of entrapment. Paul knows in Romans chapter 2 that the people of Israel are no better than the Gentiles they criticize, because not only do they act the same way, but they can't produce disciples. Once the Torah is preached, suddenly it becomes apparent to everyone that the people hearing it are not obeying it. And the same thing is happening here with these cities. These are cities that heard the good news. Matthew is addressing the church, and that's why the topic of the critique is these various cities where the gospel was preached, that they've heard it and they didn't repent. 
So it's one thing to be from a place that is acting a certain way because they don't know any better. It's another thing to be from a city that continues to act that way, even though they should know better. They were supposed to have heard the teaching. And what I find really interesting here is when one reads the Bible as literature, one thing that you notice is the way that the author shapes time. He'll spend a long time on maybe just a few moments that happen in the story and quickly rush through days and weeks in just a moment. So it's funny because it's so quickly just gone over, he began to castigate these cities where he did most of his mighty works. Oh, the author just said most of his mighty works in like three words. After mention of these mighty works, the problematic response requires verse after verse after verse after verse, which shows you what the author is trying to do. The author is not trying to focus on the acts of Jesus and the mighty works. He is more interested in responding correctly to this teaching in the same way that Jesus is castigating his hearers for not acting according to the teaching that they heard from John the Baptist. It gives us insight into what the author of Matthew is trying to do, precisely what John the Baptist was trying to do, to encourage the listener to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And of course, what's interesting about this critique, which I take, Richard, to be a critique of the church, to be a critique of those who claim to have received the teaching of Jesus Christ, is that Tyre and Sidon are Phoenician cities. In other words, the Matthean Jesus is saying prophetically, you have the teaching and you didn't repent. But I'm telling you that if I would have gone to these Gentile outsiders and given them the teaching, these unrighteous folk, if they had heard the wonders that were preached in you, they would have repented. They would have put on sackcloth and ashes. And in a conversation we had earlier today, Richard, you point out the parallels with the book of Jonah. Jonah just shows up in Nineveh, which is the capital of the Gentile empire that is controlling Judah, and simply says, this city will be overturned in three days. From the king to the cows, everyone puts on sackcloth and ashes, everyone repents, and God decides to withhold his judgment. This is what ultimately makes Jonah so angry, because he says, well, why did I bother if you weren't going to punish them anyway? That's a side conversation that Jonah and God, unfortunately, forgot. But with this, the message simply came to Nineveh, and they repented. And Jesus is saying the same thing would have happened in Tyre and Sidon. This ties in so nicely with what John the Baptist was saying before, which is bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. If John the Baptist had been preaching in the Gentile lands, in the same way that Jonah preached in the Gentile lands, we would not be having this problem. Everything would be fine. The problem is not John the Baptist, that he's got a demon or whatever you were thinking. The problem is that people aren't listening and they aren't changing the way that they're acting. In the same way we've seen throughout Scripture, Nineveh is this shining example of what it means to repent. Interestingly, these were purely Gentiles. In verse 20, what is translated as miracles in the original Greek is the namis of to his mightiness, his power was manifest. So I think the scholars who rendered the New American Standard Bible are assuming that the miracles of Jesus are the manifestation of his dynamis. The way I hear the text, this manifestation of power is the preaching of the word. And this is critical in a section of Matthew that is dealing with this question of John the Baptist being the least powerful in human terms. So dynamis is not the miracle. Dynamis is the teaching. And again, when you consider then this admonition against Chorazin in context of the prophet Jonah, you will recall that the word evangelized Nineveh despite the prophet. So here we have a text in Matthew that is part of a broader story emphasizing the spreading of the gospel and the need for laborers to spread the teaching that Jesus is carrying. 
And now in verse 21, Jesus is critiquing the church, these cities that represent the church, because the power of God, his teaching, is going to do what it's going to do for the sake of Tyre and Sidon, with or without the church. And he's saying to them, as Jesus said to the apostles earlier when he was telling them they had to teach, and then he's like, I can't wait for you, and he went off and started doing the work. The work has to be done. The power of God's instruction has to be carried forth, and you're going down the same path as Jonah, who not only fought against that mission, but was hoping for the destruction of those who were not inside the church or inside his religious community. Remember a couple episodes ago, we were talking about how the people couldn't understand John the Baptist because they were either understanding him as a wimp or a king, but only in their own personal way of understanding what a wimp or a king meant. When it says the mighty works, are they mighty works according to scripture or are they mighty works according to what we think? And it seems that those translators were imposing a bit because what would be mighty works? Naturally, they'd be flashy miracles. Or would they be mighty works in the way that Scripture makes them, which is a humble teaching with power? Your point is well taken, Richard. I don't even see the word ergon anywhere in the text. Let's just hear the Greek text. Pliste dynamis aftu. Let's be literal in our translation. Many powers of his. So what powers? It's interesting, even the text that you're referring to is trying to explain the term dinamis in a way that makes sense to human flesh. Mighty what? It must have been a miracle. It must have been a work. That's not what the Greek says. And we know that if we're hearing Matthew correctly, the power, the might of God is manifest in his instruction. We definitely know that it's not flashy. The translator made it sound flashy. But all this chapter, Jesus has been trying to tell his audience that what they think is mighty, what they think is strong, is based on their own ideology. So translators, beware that you don't fall into the very trap that Jesus is upbraiding his audience with. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. So extending the Jonah parallel... And you want to sit down and recline under a tree, get your popcorn and your soda, and sit back and enjoy the destruction of the non-believers because you feel comfortable in your association with God. You feel as though you are on his side of the discussion, when in fact you are working against his mission, which was to bring the gospel, not only to Nineveh, but to Tyre and Sidon, to bring the Torah. Why is it worse for you? Not just because you're doing the same things as the Gentiles in Romans chapter 2. You are not producing children. You're condemned for breaking the rule of the Torah, and you're doubly condemned for not sharing the Torah with others. And the entire problem is sealed with the totality of God's condemnation against you, because he brought you the instruction first as a grace. And now Matthew is applying the same thing to the church. If you have heard the news of God's instruction, you are under the pressure of this title that is so widely misunderstood of being chosen. You were chosen to share the teaching. You said it a couple episodes ago, Father, the ultimate inevitable result of idolatry slash ideology is self-righteousness. And this verse describes precisely what self-righteousness is. While you're sitting under your tree waiting for judgment to come upon them, upon the others, you don't realize that it's going to be worse for you on that day. You think that it's necessarily good for you. This has always been the problem throughout the New Testament that's being fought against, even in the Old Testament, that the people who are chosen believe that that's good news. But like the anecdote from your childhood, when you receive this good news, you're under more judgment. If you heard John the Baptist, who told you that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the necessary response is to bring fruit worthy of repentance, and you don't bring that fruit of repentance, it's worse than the person who never heard the word and didn't bring the fruit 
of repentance because you knew that was what you were supposed to be doing. Jonah knew the power of God, yet he tried to ignore it. Nineveh did not know the power of God, yet they listened. What's interesting about Romans chapter 2 as it relates to this section of Matthew, Richard, is that Paul understands, as the biblical tradition in totality understands, that all human beings have the same flaws. So whenever Scripture deals with sin, you have to understand sin functionally, because one way or another, everybody is condemned. The difference is that to the extent that the church, or in Romans chapter 2, Israel, has not evangelized the others, they bear responsibility not only for their rejection of God's law, which is inevitable. Nobody can accept God's law. Nobody can live up to it. Everybody is unrighteous. So you can't make out of Scripture your ideological purity. Just please stop. The point is that because the ones who are engaged in the same behavior are enjoying the benefit of God's wisdom and at the same time are feeling self-righteous and therefore looking down on other people who they think are somehow different than them because of their sins, and then worse, don't share with other people the news of God's instruction, which gives life for humanity despite our sin through the spirit of repentance that is preached in Matthew, they become responsible for all of the wickedness that afflicts the poor, the needy, and the outcast. It's a very serious admonition. Our job is not to run around telling people they're wrong because they're different than us. Our job is to share the instruction. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the dinamis had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. When we bring in Sodom as a metaphor, we're pushing the issue of the way in which those who are religious insiders look at the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they say to themselves, we're not unrighteous like these people. But the real unrighteousness comes from a self-righteousness that prevents us from doing the work that we are commanded to do, which is impossible to do if we ourselves do not repent. When we think of being a son of the kingdom in human terms, we think of being right and therefore running around criticizing people who we think are wrong. But that's not what this text allows. Instead, what we should be doing is running around trying to share with people the grace that we've received, which preaches to us the forgiveness of sins and the hope of the kingdom. It's so simple. Jesus is claiming it could literally work anywhere. In this phrase, again, the translation is just a little bit off here because every translation says in Sodom, but in Greek, it looks like it says among the Sodomites. He's referring specifically to the people of Sodom and not just in the town. Sodom, in the way that it's presented in the Old Testament, I mean, the authors just heap on everything so you just think of it as the worst possible place ever. I mean, they don't show hospitality. They rape their visitors. They will rape them to death. They will kill the men. I mean, the authors describe it in such a way that there's nothing good about Sodom. That's why Jesus specifically uses Sodom in the same way that Ezekiel uses Sodom in chapter 16 in order to say that even in this horrible place, the teaching would have worked just fine. Even they would be ready to repent. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. This upends the morality of the self-righteous. Because if you try to make out of the Torah your cult of ritual purity, you will be able to sit with Jonah under the shade of a tree, eating popcorn and sipping your soda at the movie theater while an entire city gets blown up. And you'll comfort yourself that I'm not like them. I don't engage in the same behaviors as them. I'm right and they're wrong. I'm righteous and they're unrighteous. This is such an important point, and I want to be very clear. There is no difference 
between a Gentile and a Jew in Romans chapter 2, and that is the point. There is no difference between Chorazin and Bethsaida and Tyre and Sidon here in chapter 11 of Matthew, and that is the point. Well, with one exception, Richard, that is expressed in the name of Capernaum, which is the village of grace, Capernaum. You received the grace. That's the difference. And that distinction is not a credit to you the way that you are trying to cash it in. It doesn't make you better than the one from the other group that you think is unrighteous, with all due respect. It's even worse. The town that didn't hear the teaching and didn't bring fruit was completely destroyed with fire and brimstone. And you, Capernaum, which is this beautiful sound, the city of grace and beauty, who have heard the teaching, how much worse is it going to be for you? Sodom, within the context of the Gospel of Matthew, was already crucified, which means for them, there's hope. What lies ahead for the church? An ominous question, I think, in the Gospel of Matthew. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.